We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow. 344 years have passed since Ronald Reagan's address to the nation regarding the tragedy that befell the shuttle Challenger. And in his soul-stirring eulogy, the former president of the United States bolstered the resolve of not only the citizens of America, but all the citizens of planet Earth. For it served as an assurance that humanity would rise to any challenge in the name of discovery. By invoking the spirit of discovery, Reagan roused that spirit which lies dormant in all humans. Throughout the ages, our kind has cast our collective gaze to the horizon. Explorers like Sir Francis Drake, mentioned in Reagan's speech, brave the seas, unfaltering in the face of uncertainty and the unyielding might of Mother Nature. And when the seas were finally conquered, the globe circumnavigated and the continents charted, we turned our attention and our ambition to the firmament. To die in the name of discovery is not such a bitter fruit as to die in frivolous wars, yet our species often lose sight of that. Perhaps that's why these moments are so profound. For millennia beyond measure, oceans of blood have been spilled in the pursuit of wealth and power, but it's those who live and die in the pursuit of human advancement who we remember most fondly. As I write these words in the Constellation Lodge of New Atlantis, in the year 2330 AD, I do so emboldened by the knowledge that those who followed in the footsteps of the Challenger crew did expand human horizons across the galaxy. But that did not stop the bane of humanity from rearing its ugly head across the galactic stage. That bane, of course, being war. As we'll explore soon, Constellation prides itself on avoiding these pitfalls that stifle the transcendent ambition of discovery. But before you join our ranks, I should bring you up to speed on the goings-on in the galaxy. I understand it's hard to keep up with current affairs when your lungs are full of dust from the mines of Vectera. But mankind's journey from dying Earth to Alpha Centauri and beyond was not achieved without a great deal of turbulence. In 2050, humans first arrived on Mars, and were living in space within 50 years of that. Scientists were dealing with the dilemma that new technologies would soon render Earth uninhabitable. We'll discuss this dilemma more in future videos, but the architects of human interstellar expansion knew that time was of the essence. In 2156, we made it to Alpha Centauri. Three years later, the United Colonies were formed, and they established the city of New Atlantis on Jemison to serve as the seat of their power. The vastness of the galaxy was unprecedented, and it's difficult to imagine what a major colonial power would do in the face of so much free real estate. But there were other factions that developed independent of the UC. Foremost among these was the Free Star Collective, based out of Aquila City in the Cheyenne system, Established in 2188, the Collective promoted libertarian ideals that ran contrary to the more austere structure of the UC. What could possibly go wrong here? Surely there was enough Milky Way for everyone to have a bite. Alas, conflicts arose in 2194, when the UC placed a star station in the Narian system, with ambitions to annex the planet of Dapala, and eventually colonize the entire system. The settlers of Deepala did not take kindly to the station looming ominously over them, so they sought the aid of the Free Star Collective, who would always fight in the preservation of liberty. What followed was a 20-year war over the system. The people of Narion were worn down by the war effort, so the United Colonies and the Free Star Collective finally turned to diplomacy. The 2216 Treaty of Narion saw the UC cede control of the system to the Collective with the caveat that neither political faction could expand into further star systems. Both would be limited to three. Alpha Centauri, Sol, and Wolf for the UC, Cheyenne, Volai, and Narian for the Collective. 
So 92 years later, when the Freestar Collective began to spread into the neighbouring Lunara system, the United Colonies were anything but pleased. Negotiations broke down, so the UC retaliated, annihilating the Freestar Colony on planet Vesta, inciting the Colony War. This war would prove to be the most brutal of humanity's extraterrestrial history. Freestar mechs were revolutionary in achieving optimal death and destruction, while the United Colonies unleashed a weapon of their own, only less mechanical and more biological. We'll be delving more into the details of this biological weapon and this horrific war in general in my upcoming video on the secret experiment in the Crete research facility. But ultimately, the war culminated at the Battle of Cheyenne in 2311. Freestar employed hit-and-run tactics to destroy a significant number of the UC Navy's major ships. But it was a hollow victory, for many lives were lost over meaningless territorial disputes. And it was truly meaningless for so many reasons. I'll end the talk of war now, for it is anathema to the principles that make Constellation such an honourable organisation. There is no shortage of conflict in the observable universe. Planets collide, and stars explode in magnificent, calamitous supernovas. What mankind's primal propensities cause us to so often forget is that we bring something truly, indestructibly unique to the universe. We bring meaning. We are the only known source of it in a galaxy so vast and wondrous. Perhaps it exists beyond what is known to us but it is therefore our duty to find it. And that's where Constellation serves as a beacon in the darkness. In the words of Barrett, a member of the group, While everyone else is busy playing politics, we're the ones braving the unknown, charting the vastness of space. Without us, the galaxy is just a big room with the lights turned out. In the time between the Narian War and the Colony War, a man named Sebastian Banks founded Constellation, and as trusty Vasco assures, it answered to no galactic superpowers. We may be in a United Colonies city, but Constellation is an entirely neutral entity, and always has been. Banks formed Constellation in the year 2275, gathering his most gifted friends, namely Chloe Bao, accomplished physicist, Aja Mamasa, his young protege, Darius Andrus, botanist and specialist in xenoflora, Bernadette Laurent, wealthy heiress and adventurer, Everardo Gill, former smuggler, and Kadri Toma, biologist and physician. With such a talented team, the entire conceivable universe was the limit. But Banks was clearly vexed by the uncivilized habits that followed humanity into the new extraterrestrial frontier. Sebastian Banks' words to the UC in the year 2276 perfectly encapsulate his vision for Constellation and for the gallant goal of discovery. He spoke to the United Colonies prior to the outbreak of the Colony War, a conflict Banks found all too predictable to emphasise the importance of continued space exploration. This is an excerpt of his speech. That is why, my esteemed peers, I beseech you, do not forego the dreams of humanity, only to plunge civilization into an endless nightmare. The settled system stands once more on the brink of war, and for what? A dispute over space. The cosmos is infinite, and yet, like our earthbound ancestors, we have become selfishly obsessed over what we consider ours. At our core, are we a race of conquerors, of warriors? No, my friends, if nothing else, humans are explorers. So let us continue exploring. Now is the time to venture beyond the imagined borders of the settled systems and fulfill the dreams of humanity. For if we continue down this path, funding only war and not exploration, I fear there will be no one left to remember why we fought in the first place. Alas, Banks's warning was ignored. A small fortune was churned through the UC military industrial complex, and countless courageous lives were lost. Their souls flickered out like distant stars, along with their potential to channel their heroism into something that actually mattered. But that did not stop Sebastian Banks. Banks and his peers were inspired by the old world Age of Discovery, and there were many legendary explorers who etched their names into the annals of history, 
despite the unavoidable wars going on around them. One Ernest Shackleton comes to mind for me, whose imperial transantarctic expedition was directed by Winston Churchill to proceed, even with the outbreak of the First World War only one month prior. So long as Banks had associates with that same yearning for adventure, he would gladly settle for an exclusive club. In fact, as you enter the lodge for the first time, Constellation's affinity for the Age of Discovery is a warm embrace against the clinical practicality of new world design. The lodge is straight out of the Victorian era. Ornate chandeliers cast warm light across dark, wood-panelled walls. Extravagant lounges huddle around the fireplace which crackles contentedly. Every suitable surface is a repository for old books, and where those won't fit, you'll find paintings of famous explorers, or displays showing off old world tools and models. It's almost a sin to enter the lodge without pouring a brandy and waxing lyrical about perilous adventures and daring deeds. Sir Malcolm Livingston, a Constellation member we'll discuss more soon, can be credited for bringing this glamorous aesthetic to life. He wrote the following in his journal. My next step is renovating the lodge. Sebastian Banks has the good sense to name the building appropriately, but it's time to inject a bit of old world grandeur. If we are to be the gatekeepers of art, science, culture and exploration, our headquarters must express that. There are some treasures from old earth that desperately need an appropriate home. Now, Livingston was a bit of a controversial figure because he was backed by a great deal of wealth and essentially bought his way into the position of Constellation Chair. Based on what little we know of Banks, he likely wouldn't have cared for gatekeeping since he believed all humans were explorers and he wouldn't have condoned being overly sentimental towards the past when so many new discoveries laid ahead. But Livingston also noted in his journal that Banks had made a secret rite of passage for chairs of Constellation to seek out the remnants of one of the old Apollo missions on Luna. So sentimentality always had a place in Constellation. Livingston's old world grandeur undoubtedly emboldens members of Constellation, inspiring new explorers with the stories of explorers long dead. Livingston is also responsible for vetoing the decision to purchase a state-of-the-art new Model A robot. Instead, he opted to procure an original Model A, manufactured on Earth's own moon. This original robot had been rusting in some junk heap in Aquila City, but Livingston had him refurbished and named him Vasco. Banks, Livingston, Vasco. The paintings, the books, the collected treasures. There are so many references to the history of exploration, and I believe each of these stories serves as a crucial addition to the arsenal of every new Constellation member. Where better to start than with Constellation's founder, Sebastian Banks? Now, Banks is a common name, but there is one explorer who comes to mind when I hear this name. And that's Joseph Banks, the botanist who sailed aboard the HMS Endeavour with James Cook on the famous captain's maiden voyage. The Endeavour left Plymouth in 1768 and took Banks on a full circumnavigation of the globe. The aim of the voyage was to observe the transit of Venus across the Sun and to seek evidence of Terra Australis Incognita, aka the undiscovered southern land of Australia. He is credited for bringing 30,000 plant specimens from around the world home to England, and was an advocate for the British settlement of New South Wales, which happens to be where I called home before the tragic fate of Earth. Malcolm Livingston's inspiration is far more apparent, for there was a famous Scottish explorer and physician named David Livingston, who is best known for his dogged desire to discover the source of the River Nile. Livingston was so much more than an explorer though, he is almost a figure of folklore. He was a Christian missionary. He was a member of the working class who penetrated the upper echelons of Victorian society. But most importantly, he was an advocate for social reform. Between 1851 and 1873, Livingston traversed the full breadth of South Central Africa. He crossed the Kalahari. He was the first European to witness the majesty of Victoria Falls, named Musa Otunya by the locals one of the seven natural wonders of the world. According to the book titled Livingston by Tim Geel, Livingston aimed to use his fame as an explorer as a means of opening his mouth with power among men. 
It is this power with which I hope to remedy an immense evil. This immense evil was the East African slave trade. While Livingston failed to locate the source of the Nile, it is believed by many that his posthumous heroic status led to an increase in public support for the abolition of slavery. As for our favourite box of bolts, Vasco, this Model A robot was named after the 15th century Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama. The Age of Discovery roughly spanned the 15th to 17th centuries, and the Portuguese were the trailblazers in the vanguard of maritime exploration, back when their greatest rival Spain was still two separate kingdoms, Castile and Aragon. Da Gama's predecessor, Bartolomeu Diaz reached the southernmost point of Africa, rounding the Cape of Good Hope. But it was da Gama's 1497 voyage that truly opened the door to Asia. Da Gama retraced Diaz's route and proceeded around Africa before crossing the Indian Ocean and reaching India. Da Gama was the first European to sail to India. So pleased was King Manuel of Portugal that he gave da Gama a small reward, while giving himself the grandiose title of Lord of Guinea and of the navigation and commerce of Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia and India, not the humblest and most concise of titles. Vasco's namesake is a worthy one, and while this refurbished robot won't be sailing any seas, lest he become a pile of rusted junk again, he does have the great honour of guiding you to the lodge. And as you pass from the foyer into the luxurious parlour, you'll notice the portrait of another illustrious Portuguese explorer, perhaps the most significant of all seafarers in human history, for this man led the first ever circumnavigation of the globe. His name is Ferdinand Magellan, and his story has everything, from mutiny, to kidnap, to all-out war on the other side of the world. In short, I'm a big fan. Magellan? You like Magellan? Oh yeah, my favourite explorer! Around the world, come on! I already alluded to the incompetence of King Manuel, and Magellan too suffered under his reign. So Magellan sailed for the Spanish instead a decision that would incite a great deal of conspiracy and conflict during his circumnavigation. Magellan led an armada of five ships in an effort to reach the East Indies by sailing west. He was the first to reach the Pacific Ocean via Tierra del Fuego, through the aptly named Strait of Magellan. But in those days, South America and the Pacific were completely uncharted. It was Magellan who gave Patagonia its name, and he who gave the Pacific Ocean its name. Patagonia translates to land of the big feet, due to the size of the native tribes, while Pacific means peaceful sea, due to the favourable winds that the Armada experienced. Magellan believed the journey from Patagonia to Asia would take three or four days, especially with such favourable winds, but he was mistaken. The Pacific crossing took three months and twenty days. Suffice to say, the remaining ships of the Armada were unprepared. Thirty men died, and their supplies of food and water were completely exhausted. There is a silver lining though, or should I say, a ready green lining, for the sailors were able to spy the large and small Magellanic clouds in the night sky over the Pacific, two dwarf galaxies in the southern celestial hemisphere. Upon arrival in the East Indies, the drama was far from over as the Portuguese managed to get themselves embroiled in a battle on the beaches of Macton Island in the Philippines. Ferdinand Magellan survived constant insurrection among his Spanish crew. He endured almost four months lost at sea, but ultimately, he was killed by a bamboo spear. Magellan is one of many famous explorers to have their portraits adorning the walls of the lodge. Immediately after entry, on the left side of the foyer, portraits of Edmund Hillary and Jean Beret can be found. Edmund Hillary was a mountaineer from New Zealand, and the first man, along with the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, confirmed to have climbed to the summit of Mount Everest, or Everest for any other sticklers out there. Beside Hillary is Jean Beret, the first woman to complete a voyage circumnavigating the globe. She joined the expedition disguised as a man, and was an expert botanist. Opposite these two, on the staircase, hangs a portrait of Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. The portrait beside him has been perplexing me for hours. Perhaps one of you can help in the comments. My best guess would be Vladimir Komarov, the Soviet cosmonaut. His tale ended tragically on his second flight. 
A parachute failure caused his capsule to crash into the ground after re-entry, making Komarov the first human to die in a space flight. But don't forget Reagan's words, the future belongs to the brave. And Vladimir Komarov was yet another shining example of this heroism. The next portrait is another I'm unsure of. There is a resemblance to Horatio Nelson. We know him as the hero of Trafalgar, but Nelson also served as a coxswain on an expedition to the North Pole at the young age of 15. Lastly, we have a more recent portrait of a female astronaut, likely hailing from a time after humanity's escape from Earth. And beside her, the iconic picture of Amelia Earhart, perched atop her all-metal Lockheed Electra 10E. Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Earhart attempted a circumnavigational flight of the globe in this same plane, only she disappeared over the Pacific Ocean, never to be seen again. To join Constellation is to stand resolute against the perils of the unknown. All of the explorers I've mentioned thus far put their lives on the line in service to mankind. Some lived to tell the tale, some were martyrs for the cause, but every one of them put us where we are today. Will you face the final frontier with the same courage? If the answer is yes, then you found your home here at Constellation. Alas, Constellation had anything but a smooth takeoff. Banks and his peers struggled to garner any support from the major factions of the settled systems. And when Chloe Bao, one of Banks' most trusted associates, discovered the wreck of the Clark Lewis in 2282, Banks feared that the grisly reality of what happened aboard the ship would deter new explorers from venturing into the dangerous unknowns of space. What Chloe found was a ship with a breached hull and no functioning internal systems. She discovered that the helium free tanks responsible for grav jumping had ruptured and the ship's reactor had been blown into empty space. No helium free meant no jumping, no reactor meant no engines, no thrusters. That meant that the Clark Lewis was dead in space, and the crew were prisoners with no hope of rescue. The bodies Bao found had been well preserved by the lack of oxygen, signs on the frozen corpses, along with a series of personal logs, revealed to Chloe that, in the face of starvation, the trapped passengers had resorted to violence, murder, even cannibalism. This haunting phenomenon is not unheard of for explorers. While the namesakes of the ship, Lewis and Clark, had succeeded in their expedition, not all expeditions end so joyously. One of my favourite stories of exploration, the Northwest Passage Expedition of 1845, ended in tragedy. Not a quick and glorious end, burning out like stars, but a long slog for survival, across ice and desolate terrain. After HMS Erebus and HMS Terror were trapped in the ice, the deserted sailors hiked approximately 400 kilometres from King William Island to the Back River in northern Canada. As the men slowly died from exposure and starvation, it is believed that some turned to cannibalism. In the end, there were no survivors. When the Scottish surgeon John Ray discovered the remains of some crew members, he noted cut marks on some of the bones and this controversial revelation endangered the sophisticated, heroic reputation of exploration in this era. So when Chloe Bao discovered the wreck of the Clark Lewis, Banks was understandably concerned about the potential news coverage. To many it would tarnish the sophisticated reputation of Constellation and the noble name of Discovery. Space exploration was already in decline by 2282, but matters were made much worse when for no clear reason Sebastian Banks disappeared. In the year 2283, with Banks AWOL, Constellation almost collapsed. It was Chloe Bao's decision to take up the mantle of Constellation Chair that saved the organisation. But it was hanging on by a thread. For even after the Colony War of 2311, Aja Mamasa, another founding member, documents in her diary that Constellation is on the brink of disaster. The Colony War may be over, but the settled system seems to be just waiting for the next one. Exploration is now, at best quaint, at worst irrelevant. Mamasa put together a list of potential new members in hopes of beginning the next generation of exploration and revitalizing the organization. 
But of the six names mentioned, only one joined Constellation. And that man is Barrett. There is a slight contradiction in the records, as the timeline states that Barrett joined Constellation in 2305, while Mamusa's diary mentions him as a potential recruit after the conclusion of the Colony War in 2311. Whatever the case, Barrett would have a major role to play in breathing life back into Constellation, discovering the true potential of a mysterious artifact buried in Constellation's archives. The next new member was Sarah Morgan in 2320. She served as the youngest head of the United Colonies Navigator Corps. But when the Navigator Corps was dissolved only one year after her appointment, she sought out the Lodge. Her lore goes much deeper, but we'll get into that another time. Within five years, this decorated leader and avid explorer became Constellation's chair, an appointment that truly drove the organization into its next generation. One year after Morgan's arrival, Walter Stroud, co-owner of the incredibly successful Stroud Eklund Corporation, joined their ranks. Stroud's deep pockets were a good omen for the future of exploration. The following year, former Crimson Fleet pirate Vladimir Saal turned coat and lended his array of unique, morally grey skills to the group. 2325 saw the arrival of young Matteo Cartri, a theologian capable of providing a more spiritual perspective on the importance of discovery. Noel joined the following year after a direct invitation from Sarah Morgan. This gifted graduate student is Morgan's protege, much like Morgan had been Mamasa's. In 2327, a Freestar Ranger named Sam Coe entered the ranks. This addition was significant because Sam is a direct descendant of the founder of the Freestar Collective, Solomon Coe. Last but not least, Andresia, a former smuggler, joined in 2328. And that brings us to the present day, 2330, the beginning of the Spacefarer's story. Your story. Perhaps the best known motto of Constellation is the burning existential question, what's out there? For much of Constellation's tumultuous history, it seemed as though the organization would not live long enough to meaningfully answer that question. But with Sarah Morgan at the helm, a rejuvenated roster of eager explorers, and you entering the ranks, the future is bright. By the time you reach the doors of the Lodge, you'll know that something strange is happening, and it all revolves around these artifacts. The lights, the music, Sebastian Banks is out there somewhere, dead or alive we do not know. Will you lead the expedition to find him, and to get to the bottom of these artifacts? The stage is set for you, Spacefarer, to follow in the footsteps of all the explorers I've mentioned today. The future of human discovery may be on the brink of a renaissance. The fate of the settled systems hangs in the balance. Mysteries beyond human comprehension are at play, spanning the known and unknown reaches of the universe. Welcome to Constellation, Spacefarer. And there you have it. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey into the cosmos. I was lucky enough to be given early access to Starfield by Bethesda, and while there are so many things to talk about in this absolutely massive game, it seemed fitting to choose this spoiler-free topic as my first foray into Starfield. If it wasn't obvious already, I'm endlessly fascinated by tales from the Age of Discovery, and beyond. And the inspiration Bethesda took from these stories when making the game is palpable. I hope some of these tales enhance your experience when you begin your adventure into the Starfield. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing for more in-depth Starfield lore. Thanks again for watching, my name is Drew, this is Drew Mora, and I'll finish the video with an excerpt from High Flight by 19-year-old John Gillespie McGee Jr., an Anglo-American volunteer in the Royal Canadian Air Force who died in a mid-air collision during World War II. Oh, I've slipped the surly bonds of Earth, and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew, and while with silent, lifting mind I've trod, the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God.